One last thing that I want to do before we wrap up derivatives and begins to take a preview of what is coming in our second quarter of calculus is looking at what is called the antiderivative, or really how we answer the question, how do we find derivatives in reverse? And that derivative in reverse is what we call the antiderivative. And we say that the antiderivative of f of x, lowercase f of x, is the function f of x, but notice it's capital F of x, whose derivative is the lowercase f of x. In other words, if f, capital F of x, the derivative of that is lowercase f of x, then the capital F of x is the antiderivative of the f of x. Maybe it's better with an example. How about we consider f of x equals 3x squared. Now, based on our power rule, which we know, but we're going to do it in reverse, we can conclude that capital F of x, the antiderivative, must be equal to x cubed. Because notice the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So the antiderivative of 3x squared is x cubed. It's the process in reverse. However, there's something we need to note. What if capital F of x equaled not just x cubed, but x cubed minus 1? Or if capital F of x equaled maybe x cubed plus 7. If we took the derivative of both of these, the derivative of the x cubed is the 3x squared we want, and the derivative of the negative 1 is 0. Similarly, with the other equation, with the plus 7, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, and the derivative of the 7 goes to 0. So we actually ended up with three potential antiderivatives of 3x squared. We've got just x cubed, x cubed minus 1, or x cubed plus 7. And actually, you can see that we could extend that concept to basically say we could add any constant number to the x cubed, and we would still have an antiderivative. Let's note that. We can add any constant and we'll call that constant c, to any antiderivative. That means we're going to have to note that in our final solution. So when we say the antiderivative, actually, let's write this down, different color. So the antiderivative. of 3x squared is x cubed plus any constant. 
So let's see if we can kind of use what we know about derivatives and apply those rules in reverse. Let's see if we can do a few examples. Let's say f of x equals 5x to the fourth. Capital F of x, the antiderivative, then. We know that with the power rule, the exponent moves out front and reduces by 1. So we can see the power of 5 moved out front, and then it shrunk 1 from 5 down to 4. So f, capital F of x, the antiderivative, must be x to the fifth plus any constant. Let's try another one. Let's say f of x is equal to 1 over x. Well, we recognize 1 over x as the derivative of one of our special functions. 1 over x is the derivative of the natural log of x. So the antiderivative must be the natural log of x plus any constant. What about trig? Let's do f of x equals sine of x. What is the antiderivative? We're really asking whose derivative is the sine of x? Well, we know the sine of x is the derivative of cosine of x, but there's that extra negative. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So we might assume the derivative of negative cosine then must be the positive sine. And of course, it's going to be plus any constant. What about f of x equals e to the x? Well, this is our favorite function because the derivative is itself. And so likewise, the antiderivative will be itself plus any constant. So we've been kind of playing with this idea of an antiderivative, of just kind of thinking the derivative of what should equal this, what do we know about derivatives, what patterns can we notice to kind of come up with the solution. But let's formalize what we're doing here with the formal notation for these antiderivatives. The formal notation is we'll use this little squiggly sign. That squiggly sign we call the integral. The integral of f of x, and then we'll put a dx so we know the variable we're taking the integral of with respect to x. The integral of f of x dx is going to be equal to that capital F of x plus a constant. That integral sign tells us, find the antiderivative. And just like we have a bunch of derivative rules, like the derivative off to the side here, like if we want the derivative of x squared, that's equal to 2x. We've got those derivative rules. We also have integral rules as well. And we have one for powers, the power rule. The power rule says the integral of x to any exponent, dx, is equal to, well, let's see if we can piece this together. The derivative makes the exponent shrink by 1. So we need the exponent to go up by 1. Of course, the derivative says the exponent is multiplied out front. So we're going to divide by that new exponent. And with integrals, there's always a plus c. This is the power rule, a useful formula to be able to use quite quickly. And just like we use the power rule with derivatives a lot, we're going to use the power rule with integrals a lot. There's actually a whole lot of integral rules. Just to give you a taste here, these, 
this is table is copied out of your textbook. So I'll put a number two here, maybe. C textbook for more integral rules. And this table is in 4.10. And you can see this table. And it kind of takes the differentiation formula, which we're familiar with, and does it backwards with an integration formula. The second one is the power rule that we just solved. So there's lots of formulas in there. But we're going to focus mainly on the power rule. Let's see if we can find the integral of 7x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x minus 7 dx. We'll take this one term at a time. With the 7x cubed, we keep the 7, the constant out front. The x cubed goes up to 4. And then we divide by that new exponent. Then we have minus 5x squared. Now it goes up, because we're doing the antiderivative, goes up to 3. And we divide by that exponent. Plus 2x, we increase the exponent by 1, so now it's squared. And we divide by the exponent. Minus 7. Increase the exponent by 1. Right now, it was x to the 0. That's why it's not there. Increase it by 1. We have x to the first. And we divide by 1. We don't really need to say the divide by 1, but the 2 over 2 does reduce. And so our final integral is 7x to the fourth over 4 minus 5x to the third over 3 plus x squared minus 7x. And don't forget, we always need, with integrals and antiderivatives, a plus c. We can use the power rule to even integrate some more interesting looking things. Like, for instance, the integral of x cubed minus 2 times the fourth root of x over x squared dx. Now, to help us out here, we're going to massage the function a little bit to make it something we can use in our power rule. One thing we can do because of the minus in there is we can distribute the divide by x squared onto both parts. So we actually have the integral of x cubed over x squared minus 2. And let's change that fourth root to an exponent, x to the 1 fourth over x squared dx. Well, we can continue to simplify by subtracting exponents. x cubed over x squared is just x minus 2x to the 1 fourth minus 2. 2. Well, 2 is 8 fourths, so 1 fourth minus 8 fourths is negative 7 fourths power dx. Moving up to give us a little more room, let's take the derivative now, or the integral. For the x, we raise the exponent by 1 to get x squared and divide by 2 minus 2x. And then we raise the exponent by 1, or 4 fourths, to get negative 3 fourths, and divide by the new exponent of negative 3 fourths. Of course, there's going to be a plus c at the end. Never forget the plus c. Cleaning up a little bit, we've got a negative negative. That makes it positive. Dividing by a fraction means multiplying by the reciprocal. So let's multiply by 4 thirds instead. So we have x squared over 2 plus 2 times 4 is 8. 
Negative exponent moves it down, x to the 3 fourths, plus a constant. And so we have x squared over 2 plus 8x, 8 over 3x to the 3 fourths plus our constant. Let's try one more. Let's see if we can do a trig one. The integral of cosine of 3x dx. Now, I know the antiderivative of cosine, or what's going to give me cosine when I take the derivative. That's going to be the sine. So I might think maybe sine 3x plus c is my integral. And you'd be very close if you said that. But remember, the chain rule says if we take the derivative of sine of x, the derivative of sine of 3x would be cosine of 3x times the derivative of the inside, which would be times 3. So we have to undo that times 3. And the best way to undo times 3 is to divide by 3. So the integral, or antiderivative, of cosine 3x is the sine of 3x divided by 3 plus a constant. Take a look at some of these in the assignment as you practice a few of these. These antiderivatives or integrals are really about pattern recognition, trying something out and seeing, hmm, that's close. How can I adjust to get closer until you get something that is correct? In Calc 2, we'll talk about a lot of strategies to make some of this easier. But for now, we want to kind of get some exposure and some experience with integrals and antiderivatives. So take a few of these, and we will see you in class to discuss them further.